Okay, fine. Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues, which is a special edition, not only because of the fact that this is recorded as opposed to live, but because of our guest today, Ambassador Michael Oren. We've had the opportunity to listen and to learn from Ambassador Aaron in the past. He is a historian, an author, a politician, a former ambassador to the United States from the State of Israel, a former member of Knesset of the Kulanu Party, a former deputy minister. But most importantly, he is one of the most insightful commentators about what's going on in Israel and especially Israel in the United States. Ambassador Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today. Always a delight and an honor to be with you. Thank you. So no. let's jump into it right away. The reason which we had to do this special recording as opposed to going live on Wednesday is because you're going to be commenting on President Herzog's speech to Congress in honor of the 75th anniversary. Is there anything, is there anything we should expect that will be surprising about his presentation? Is there anything that will be earth shattering? I don't think so. I don't expect it to be. I think uh, that President Herzog will extol the common democratic values uh, still between the two countries, our common strategic interests, our defense uh, alliance. Uh, he'll tell some, he's, he's, a, he's a great raconteur, so he'll tell some interesting stories. I think far more interesting is the conversation that will go on, as they say in Hebrew, four-eyed conversation, uh, face-to-face, uh, between the two heads of state. And keep in mind that uh, Isaac Herzog is the head of state here. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is the head of government, not the head of state. And so the counterpart to President Biden is President uh, Herzog. And they will have that eye-to-eye, four-eyed conversation uh, alone, probably, without assistance in the in the Oval Office. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Let's just say this is pure speculation on my part, but it's, I would say, it's informed in speculation that... Uh, the President Herzog will be bringing a package uh, that will aim to uh, diffuse uh, the current crisis between the two governments. Uh, may perhaps a way that uh, the Israeli government and its prime minister can be incentivized to back down uh, from its reform package in return uh, for certain favors and certain concessions from the United States. And I, I speak from experience only because uh, many years ago, um, President Obama asked for a 10-month settlement freeze uh, from the state of Israel. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was very reluctant to give it to him, but he gave it to him in the end on the understanding that Pri- Pri- President Biden would not ask for an, for an extension uh, of that freeze once the 10 months were compl- completed. And of course, once the 10 months were completed, President Obama proceeded to ask for an extension publicly, which created a great political morass uh, for us. And it was resolved. Israel gave a three-month extension, but in return for the first shipment of F-35 jets. And so something like that, and I read Tom Friedman this past week wrote an editorial in the New York Times. We know he's not uh, um, shy to be critical about the state of Israel, but suggested that the relationship between the United States and Israel is going through a significant change and there's that the American government is reassessing its commitment to Israel. Do you think that's the case? It's like being in Arizona right now and saying it's hot outside. <laughs> it's kind of tautological. tautological. It's uh, yes, it's going through a reassessment. It's going through a recession. But the question is, how far can that reassessment go? Uh, the, the United States is not going to cut back on aid to Israel uh, for many reasons, but the, not the least of which is that 100 percent of that aid is spent in the United States. It's a subsidy for the American arms industry. And if you cut back that aid, you are basically sentencing thousands, potentially tens of thousands of American workers to unemployment. Um, and on a presidential election year, I don't think anybody wants to do that. Um, so what does that reaccession mean? Maybe uh, if there's a condemnation in the Security Council, a resolution condemning Israel for building settlements in Judea and Samaria, the United States may not veto that. Or, you know, Chas Khalilah, the United States, Israel gets into a war with Hezbollah and asks for the resupply of certain types of munitions, uh, the United States could hold up the supply of, re- of munitions. There, there are many things that happen. You know, P.S. Obama did precisely that in 2014 in our war with Gaza. So there are ways, the different shapes and forms the reassessment contain, but not the reassess- not the way that I think the Thomas Friedman was intimating that there could be a cutback in aid. And in terms of a lot of the tension that's taking place, it's around the judicial reform and the protests that are taking place. Is it unusual for the United States to step in and and make suggestions to offer opinions of what's happening with within the boundaries of a of a friendly country of a of an ally? 
Well, I don't see the United States doing that with France, which has gone through major upheaval in recent weeks. Uh, other countries that have un undergone that type of upheaval, the United States has not done that. Uh, it, 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 uh, it arrogates the right to do so with us. One of the reasons that it can do so, according to Tom Freeman and to many other people, including ma many leaders in the American Jewish community, is because the United States gives Israel aid, about $4 billion in aid every year. Uh, I've heard it repeatedly from American Jews who have said we have a right to express our opinions and even to demonstrate against the Israeli government over the reform issue because we pay taxes to the U.S. government and the U.S. government gives Israel aid. If you break it down, that means every American Jew is spending a couple of dollars uh, in aid for Israel as compared to the 55 percent of the taxes that I pay to the state of Israel uh, out of my salary. Um, so, you know, th that is one reason why the United States arrogates to itself uh, that right to interfere. Uh, I, I'm very disquieted by it, I must tell you. Is it fair? And I know that's a broad question for people to think that way, or is it, are they just really um, using it as an excuse to protest what they think are uh, policies that are too far to the right? Well, you know, in my world, the word fair doesn't come into play. The question is, is it smart? And um, and I don't at this point, I don't think it's smart. I think the fact that uh, the president has spoken with the prime minister today and invited him to a meeting in the United States, albeit not to the White House, just to the United States, uh, is a symbol that uh, I think the administration realizes that it's gone too far. Why is it not smart? First of all, it sends a message. It sends a message to our common enemies, but particularly our enemies on the northern border to Hezbollah, which has been engaged with prov in provocations all the last two weeks. So Hezbollah has internalized that there's a rift between the United States and Israel and is taking advantage of that. Now, that could end up dragging Israel into a war, which the United States does not want. And it certainly doesn't want a war that can turn into a regional conflict in which the United States itself could be dragged in. So what have you gained? What have you gained by sort of sticking a finger in the eye of Bibi and then yourself involved in a war? It doesn't, doesn't add up. The question is also whether it's, uh, whether it's advantageous politically for the president. Keep in mind the president is uh, facing an election year. He's not uh, riding a weight of popularity, I must say. Um, um, some of my own family, they're all Democrats in my family, are saying they can't vote for him because they're afraid that voting for him is a vote for Kamala Harris, and they're not willing to vote for her for president just yet. Um, and I think he fears that the, the Democratic Party could put up another candidate, certainly the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, which stays quite strong and vocal, could put up a, a candidate. And that wing is very disappointed in the president's handling uh, of the Middle East situation. Uh, the president had promised to reopen the U.S. consulate in East Jerusalem. He did not do that. He promised to clamp down on uh, Israeli settlement building. He did not do that. He promised to reanimate the peace process. Did not do that. Um, and so he's basically has thrown that progressive wing a, a, a bone. And that on that bone is written the non-invitation to the White House of Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, on the other hand, the, prime, the president has, uh, has enjoyed extensive support from the American Jewish community. Uh, I know him personally very well. I know he's deeply committed to the state of Israel, and he's, he has a wonderful relationship with the American Jewish community. He has the, the best Rosh Hashanah parties in Washington or at the Biden's house. Uh, and uh, and he doesn't in any way want to uh, alienate that vote. About as many as 80 percent of American Jews vote for a Democratic candidate, certainly if the the, the Republican candidate is going to be Donald Trump. And... Um, he doesn't want to alienate that. So what does he do while he's not inviting Netanyahu? He invites Herzog. And uh, it's a great opportunity, Israel's 75th uh, anniversary. But it, it, it tends to very much throw into relief uh, the crisis, um, which I don't think is to anybody's benefit right now. Um, I want to say one more thing, if I could. This is a rather long, long winded uh, response. And that is um, my mother, bless her, 95 years old was in her uh, professional days a, a family therapist. And her famous line was, uh, the presenting problem is not the problem. And the presenting problem here is the reform and uh, President Biden's discomfort with it and the demonstrations here. Uh, but I don't think it's the real problem. I think the real problem is the presence of ministers like Ben Vere and Schmutrich in Israel's government, uh, the fear that they will continue to support uh, settler violence against the Palestinians. And that is just, to have the, the head of a government uh, who represents these individuals and who is not in control of these individuals in the White House is very problematic for this president. And in terms of Netanyahu and his government and Smotrich and Ben Gvir, do you see that 
the, that wing of uh, support of the coalition growing? Do you think that Ben Gvir's support will grow if there were another election, that Smutrich's support will grow? Um, it could be. I think it's too early to tell right now. Um, certainly their constituencies are growing uh, on one hand. On the other hand, keep in mind that Netanyahu put them, um, and if I know Netanyahu well, he put them on purpose in two of the most non-win positions in the Israeli government. You know, <laughs> there are positions in the Israeli government that are no lose. You can be foreign minister. You can't lose as foreign minister. Trust me, all you do is shake hands and look good in front of the camera. And you don't work that hard. You get, some, get a full night's sleep. Um, it's iffy whether a defense minister can succeed or not. But a, a finance minister almost never succeeds. And that's what Smutrich is. And the minister of internal security in charge of the police almost never succeeds. And that's what Ben Gvir is. And so with every terrorist attack that occur, and terrorist attacks are, are quite tragically are continued to occur, uh, people are going to say to Ben Gvir, hey, wait a minute, you promised to end this, and you didn't. And as housing prices and the cost of living keep on going up, people are going to say to Smutrich, hey, you promised to end this, and you didn't. And I'm speaking from personal experience. I was a member of a party that promised to bring down housing uh, prices, and we didn't. And guess who's no longer in Knesset? And so... Behind all of this, you still have, uh, it sounds like you have great respect for the political acumen of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Oh, he's a brilliant, he's a brilliant tactician. But keep in mind, um, he is not necessarily the, the Netanyahu I knew in his prime, um, how many of us are. And, uh, and two, he is also a weak Netanyahu. Uh, Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu always wanted to be the centermost person in his coalition. He wanted parties to the right of him and to the left of him so we could play them off one another. He finds himself now in the inevitable position of being the leftmost person in his coalition. Everyone's to the right of him. And everyone's got a gun to his head saying, if you don't do what I say, I'll take down this coalition. And uh, that makes him very, very weak. I had a, a professor many years ago, Asher Aryan, uh, a former American, I love a shalom. And uh, I once asked him in a, in a Hillel-like way, he was a professor of, of Israeli political science, and I once asked him in a Hillel-like fashion to teach me all of Israeli politics while standing on one leg. <laughs> and he had a great response. The response was, Israeli politicians always prefer collective to individual suicide. And, <laughs> and you see that playing out now in negotiations with, uh, with Yair Lapid and uh, Benny Gantz uh, and Netanyahu's team under the aegis of the president, where the opposition is saying, you know, the whole country could collapse, but I'm going to win. Uh, or conversely, I'm not going to die <laughs> and the whole country can collapse. And so I think that was a very uh, intelligent observation by the late uh, professor of mine. Well, going back, to your, going back to your mother's observation about the presenting problem, it, are the protests a major problem? Or are they just they, a piece? Well, we have to see them in proportion. Okay, it's not just the protests, it's the reserve officers, particularly the pilots who are saying that they won't show up for reserve duty and what that means. Um, it is a, a precedent that has been set, a very unfortunate precedent from my perspective, not everybody agrees with me, that the, the, the army has for the first time been politicized. Uh, so is the labor union, the history do. Uh, our Israeli airport was closed only for the second time in history and the first time was by Hamas. And these are precedents in the sense that you could have a government five years from now that could be center left I mean, our previous government was center, center left, and uh, that there may be a peace process and that government may want to make territorial concessions. And all of a sudden, the army is going to say, well, 50 percent of our officers wear kippot and we're not going to agree with it. And you have that percent. You have that. You have that uh, precedent. Most of the people in this are, are workers and they tend to be right wing. They could say, OK, we're going to shut down the economy. So you have these precedents and they're very, very problematic. Beyond that. Um, we have to keep in mind that maybe 150, at most 200,000 people are protesting, but that means 9.4, 9.6 million Israelis are not protesting. And they also have uh, a view. And I'm speaking again from people I know in my own family who are saying they, they abhor the reforms, they detest the government, but they're not comfortable with, with, the, with demonstrations that are designed to overturn the elections uh, or designed to uh, you know create a... a, a a, a nation state together with the Palestinians, right? A single nation state. There, there are many protests going on here. Um, and I also live in South Tel Aviv, in Jaffa, 
uh, I'm a member of a, of a congregation that is overwhelmingly Mizrahi, uh, tends to be rather blue collar. And uh, they see this entire situation in a very different way. They look at what's happening in northern Tel Aviv and uh, saying, well, this is a lot of elite Ashkenazi people who are rallying around the last bastion of Ashkenazi power, which is the Supreme Court. And they refuse to relinquish the power that they lost at the polls. And I hear this repeatedly. I live in a building that's mostly French, and I hear this from all my neighbors. Uh, so very, very different interpretations of what's going on. And you don't often hear that voice in the American press, I gather. But it's no. a very, very prominent, very prominent voice here indeed. Um, there are many problems beneath the surface here of the reform. It's not just Mizrahi and Ashkenazi. It's periphery and center. How many demonstrations are going on in Kiryat Shmona to the north? And how many are going on in Nitivot and Ofakim in the south? Look carefully. Um, it is not just left and right. It is the very fundamental division between what I call the normal Israel and the abnormal Israel. The normal Israel are people who want to fulfill the vision of many of our founding fathers and mothers who wanted to create a, a normal country here, a country like any other country. And they want that country. They want a country, that, yes, where we speak Hebrew and we have a, a Jewish calendar, uh, but a country that is in many ways like a, like a Middle Eastern Sweden uh, in terms of rights for people of different backgrounds, for minorities, LGBT, um, freedom, great food, great beach is a normal country. But then you have the abnormal Israelis. And what do I mean by abnormal Israelis? These are the people who recall that uh, God said to Avram Abinu uh, 4,000 years ago, guess what? You're not going to be normal. You're not going to be like everybody else. And for 4,000 years, we've been abnormal. And what's basically kept us together as a people. And why these Israelis ask when we finally get an independent state in our homeland, why would we want that to be a normal country? We want it to be a Jewish country. So you see these divisions? They're very, very deep. And yeah. holding together, you know, <laughs> those darn Arabs. What can I say? Those darn Arabs. We relied on them to have a conflict with us for 70 years. And that conflict sort of compressed Israel and kept all the divisions under the surface. They started making peace with us, those darn Arabs. <laughs> and so the pressure lessened off, eased off. And all these schisms have come to the first season. And, and our big challenge in the future will be to say, OK, how can we bridge these schisms and how can we remain a united democratic and Jewish state? Well, that brings me actually to your book, 2048, you. which I enjoyed very much reading. For those who don't know about it, uh, Ambassador Oren published the book 2048, The Rejuvenated State, with a vision for Israel 25 years out in that for the 100th anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel. And it's a fascinating book with each of the different challenges, its own chapter, and then translated also into Arabic and also into Ivrit. I'm not sure what the original language you wrote it in. I assume it wasn't Arabic. But Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you, and this idea of the abnormal normal state is something that even you, you touch on in the right away at the beginning of the book itself. This is a book with a lot of hope. Um, it's a book talking about opportunities that arise from the challenges that we face. If you were writing the book today versus several months back or a year back, when you actually started in the pandemic, if I recall, in the opening, if you were writing the book today, would it still be the same book? It'd be the same book, exactly the same book, but I think it'd be some sharper. I think the notion of abnormal and, and normal would be sharper. What's interesting here is that uh, I wrote the book about three years ago, and there's a chapter on the need to reform the Supreme Court. Yes. And this is an, a topic on which I uh, I worked, I addressed quite frequently in the Knesset. I suggested many ways for reforming it because I realized that the situation, the status quo wasn't sustainable. Uh, because um, uh, sitting Supreme Court judges and other jurists have a preponderant voice in determining uh, which judges will replace those sitting judges. And because judges are also human beings and they naturally choose people who agree with them and not disagree with them, the the Supreme Court, in terms of its worldview, kept on perpetuating itself, basically marching in place ideologically, whereas the Knesset, which immediately reflected shifts in public opinion in Israel, moved precipitously to the right. So the distance between the worldviews grew and grew and grew and began to snap with uh, the Supreme Court overturning legislation from the Knesset and people in the Knesset saying we need an override law that will say, you know, the, the Supreme Court can say what it wants, but at the end of the day, we're the sovereign. If we vote by majority of 61 out of 120, we can override the Supreme Court. 
And I was very worried about the situation because I believe that the principle of judicial oversight of judicial review is one of the great pillars of any democracy, including America's democracy. And uh, so I suggested in the book ways that we could reform the Supreme Court, way we can alter the way Supreme Court judges are chosen, the way we can limit the scope of the Supreme Court, which is the widest in the world, by the way, without without um, imploding this pillar, without collapsing the pillar of judicial review. Um, my problem with the current reform proposals of the government is that it makes far reaching uh, uh, proposals for reform, but does not uh, preserve that principle, does not preserve checks on the legislative and executive form of government, which in Israel basically must the same thing as the government is drawn from the Knesset. It'd be the equivalent of the, uh, President Biden and every member of his Knesset being an active member of Congress. Uh, that's the case in, in Israel's uh, judicial, in Israel's um, electoral system. So I'm, I'm very worried about the future of judicial review, and that's precisely what's bringing these the demonstrators out to the street, trying to maintain that balance. But you also had pieces on here, for example, in the, in the book on Israel's New Deal, on looking at opportunities to revive the society and economy. Um, what of all of the ideas you have in the book, what do you what would you hope to be the first thing that would be able to be implemented or do they have to go parallel? The first thing to be implemented, I believe, has to be, believe it or not, Haredi education. And this is a, an issue with which I dealt for more than 20 years. Um, back in the early part of the century, when I was a fellow at the Shalem Center and I was sitting with my good friends, Nathan Sharansky and then Bogi Ayalon. Yossi Klein Levy, all in the same seminar, it was quite extraordinary. Uh, I made a presentation called The Existential Threats Facing Israel. And, um, and among the existential threats were Iran, of course, and, uh, and, and terror, and back then water, we didn't have enough water. But I listed the Haredi issue as one of the, one of the potentially existential threats facing Israel for the simple reason that uh, demographically, uh, by Israel's 100th birthday in 2048, uh, about roughly half the elementary school children in the state of Israel will be Haredi. And those elementary school teachers, school children were receiving less than a second grade education in math and English and would not be able to uh, integrate into the Israeli economy, certainly not an advanced technological economy. And that the people, who, the, the small, every, the ever shrinking group of Israelis who are paying the taxes will say, listen, we've had it, we're leaving. And the country would not be sustainable nor defensible. Um, and so the key, I thought, I think there's much discussion there about about whether Haredim should serve in the army, I thought it was the wrong issue. I thought not whether they should serve in the army, but whether they can be integrated into the economy. And um, and I must say that uh, Nathan Sharansky and Bogi had a great issue with what I said. They said uh, the Haredim are not a danger; they're a, they're a uh, they're an opportunity. And I think we're all both right. Uh, I have great respect for the Haredi communities uh, of Israel, and I was the first as ambassador, the first ambassador to meet with the Haredi leadership of the United States. And I learned a lot. Not at least to say that there's no Haredi community in the United States, there are Haredi communities. Um, I mean, this is a population which in Israel, at least, has volunteered to be impoverished for what it believes is. That's extraordinary in the world today. Um, all I would seek would be to give Haredi young people an education, an education that would enable them to work, enable them to contribute to the economy and part of Israel. And that way, I, I in no way uh, seek to change their Haredi uh, way of life. Um, but that's all. To me, if I could change one thing right now, uh, that would be it. But isn't there change taking place going back to the efforts of Adina Bar Shalom, Rabbi Ovadji Yosef's daughter, who opened up opportunities for, for advanced education, even at uh, Machon Lev, the Jerusalem College of Technology, the work they're doing with Haredi populations to educate and prepare them for the workforce? Aren't there there's, great, there's great effort that's going on, and there are efforts to bring them into the Haredi battalion of the, of the IDF. Uh, the problem is um, that it's not keeping pace with the growth of the community. And um, you know, roughly 51% of Haredi males work, but many of them work part-time. Uh, women work part-time, uh, they're paid less. And um, the idea is to actually bring Haredi into, in Haredi into the economy the way they are in the United States. I had a, a great association at Toro College in New York, uh, which graduates hundreds of Haredi doctors and lawyers every year. And so it can be done. But there is this, this model, this cycle in Israel where the government gives vast amounts of money to the Haredi education system that keeps, uh, it perpetuates the uh, system of not granting this type of education to its young people. It, may, and it keeps them very dependent uh, on their rabbinical leaders 
And um, it's, it's a cycle which in, increasingly will erode uh, public confidence in the state. And the, the harshest comments I receive now from people to read the book is, you know, why should I raise my kids here? Or why should I go in the army? Because in any case, this country will not be able to survive the, you know, the Malthusian progress of, of the Haredi growth rate. And, uh, and I hear that so often, and I right now don't have an answer for it. But is it something that can be done? You know, there's a wonderful phrase of evolution instead of revolution. Is it something that can be imposed on a community? You no, it cannot. And I say that, I say that unequivocally in the book. It can't be imposed. Right. It has to be done in cooperation with. And that's how it works in New York, in New York City, too. It's done in cooperation with. And it has to be done quietly. One of the interesting things about Turo is they don't take they don't take graduation photos. <laughs> if you know this, I thought that was very interesting. They don't take graduation photos, and it's fine. Who cares about graduation photos? But uh, it, it 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 can be done, but it has to be done in cooperation. It cannot be imposed. Is there any indication in the Haredi community that you're aware of that some of these ideas have have life? That there is possibility, or is there? Yeah, just there have been indications, for example, in the Bell's community of a willingness to open to new modern education. Um, and uh, I think that uh, if, if the government would, were on board on this, and I don't see the government being on this government being on board with this, it would be, it would perhaps be easier. When you're uh, being interviewed by CNN or any of the other news outlets from the United States or even the BBC out of England, what are the big issues that they are looking at today? Uh, almost exclusively the Palestinians. And, uh, you know, when I, I, I spent a lot of time in foreign relations, uh, both in government and as ambassador. And when you meet Europeans in particular and you tell them that, according to Israeli polls, uh, show that Israelis care the most about security, then they care the most about housing prices, then the cost of living. The thing they care the least about are the Palestinians. Uh, about four percent of Israelis put that as number one. Europeans are shocked. Uh, liberal Americans are shocked because that's all they talk about is the Palestinians. Most uh, Israelis have internalized uh, the realization that there is no quick fix here, that the Palestinians are incapable slash unwilling slash disinterested in a two-state solution, even if one were possible. There are, and uh, and that you know it is we, we're going to have to maintain security and perhaps improve the lives of Palestinians and better manage the conflict in the absence of a real solution. And so are they just, are, is the media just stuck in an old story and not able to move past it? It's not just the media, it's governments. And I know from my, my candid conversation with American officials, even within the Democratic Party, they know that this is a, a no-win situation, that there's no one to talk to on the Palestinian side, uh, President Mahmoud Abbas is in the 18th year of his four-year term, and uh, he won't stand for re-election. You know, Hamas, if, if there were a Palestinian state, would fall to, to Hamas or Islamic Jihad or to ISIS within a matter of days. Uh, no Israeli government can can agree to withdraw in that way, or even to give up the right of hot pursuit. Um, and even within Israel itself today, there's, there's very little support for two-state solution. But that doesn't stop the U.S. government and governments in Europe throughout the West to keep on harping on the two-state solution. And, and by doing that, they are missing an opportunity to look at other possible ways of moving forward through federal solutions, through cantonment, uh, through greater autonomy. There's so many ways you can move if you're not committed to a formula which has exactly zero chance of success. I'll leave you with just one thought. Uh, America's longstanding position has been, has been that there should be two states for two peoples, the Jewish people and the Palestinian people, but no Palestinian leader ever ever has ever accepted that formula. And you know why? Because they don't recognize us as a people. Because there never was a temple in Jerusalem. There never was a King David, right? That we don't exist. We're just a religion and a fault. We have a falsified history. And they use those words, a falsified history. Even if you had two states, the Israeli state would recognize the Palestinian state as legitimate, but the Palestinian state would recognize, would not recognize the Jewish state as legitimate. And you'd have immediate irredenta. Uh, Ambassador, our time is up. I respect very much the uh, your time on this especially, and I really thank you for once again joining us, and I encourage everyone to find out how they can get it, the 
Rejuvenated State 2048. It's published by Toby Press, available from Corin. I'm sure it's available on Amazon and everywhere else you want to buy a book. It is fascinating. And uh, even though sometimes you may say it's got a lot of pages to it, this is one of those books where you only have to read a third because it's in the three different languages. It's a fast read, but it's something that stays with you because of all that it has to say. Thank you so very much. And I look forward to another opportunity soon to be able to speak with you again. Thank you. Right. Good evening. Call to. Bye-bye.